Good morning. I call the um, House Education Finance Committee to order. And I think first up we have the minutes from March 7th. And would anybody like to move the minutes from March 7th? Uh, Representative Jordan, are you okay to do that? Oh, she's, she's faster than I am on the draw today. So move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Jordan, move the minutes from March 7th. Any questions on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The minutes from March 7th are adopted. With that, members, we're going to move right into our first presentation today. And that is a presentation from Pelsby to talk about some of the implementation they've been doing with um, the changes in the money we gave them last year. So come on down, and I believe they have a PowerPoint as well. It's loaded up. And once you get settled, get your PowerPoint up. Just state your names for the record and proceed. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair Yuki, members of the committee, thank you for having us here today. My name is Dr. Elena Bailey, and I am the Executive Director of the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, otherwise known as PELSBY, and I have here with me today my Chief of Staff, Michelle Hirschbach. Um, we can jump right in. We're very excited to share some implementation updates on all of the fantastic things you all passed last year. Um, before we um, jump into that, I do like to give a little bit of background on Pelsby and our work, um, starting with our mission and vision because it helps center all of the work that we do. So Pelsby's mission is ensuring all Minnesota students have high quality educators in their schools. And our vision is to ensure equitable education practices through high uh, licensure standards, quality educator preparation programs, and stakeholder engagement. This is just a quick picture of our current board members. Um, one of the things that was passed last year is the addition of two teacher members. So we are now a teacher majority board, although we have two open seats right now. Um, so we are very excited about that. And our board is, of course, <coughs> led by Dr. Angela Osuji, who is a science teacher in Shakopee Middle School. Um, as far as our jurisdiction and scope of work, I think this is helpful to uh, remind folks, especially given the sometimes confusion with our lovely colleagues at MDE, but I like to quickly explain that we are kind of the uh, state agency that does most things or all things teacher related. So that includes all of the licensure work, Pathways to Licensure. Um, we oversee 38 uh, teacher preparation providers in the state of Minnesota. And that is nearly 760 teacher preparation programs, so programs being the different licensure areas. Um, we now have added, thanks to you, a heritage language and culture pathway. And we now have additional staff to help with the licensure via portfolio and other alternative pathways because those are equally important as we try to deal with the teacher shortage and elevate the profession. We also oversee all licensure and renewal for teachers in the state of Minnesota, and we serve just over 114,000 licensed teachers in the state. So that is a lot of teachers. Um, this gives you some data on kind of what we process on a yearly basis. We, of course, do quite a bit of board work and policy work. Um, we have monthly meetings, special meetings when needed, and a retreat. And then our board does quite a bit of committee work, um, which is regularly scheduled. We oversee teacher ethics in the state of Minnesota. And I like to acknowledge that um, we are very lucky that our teachers are excellent um, individuals and we rarely have to take action. So in 2022, we only took 63 actions um, against teacher licenses. So it's a good sign. Um, we do quite a bit of work with data and compliance so we can get you some of the statistics and visuals of the profession which are included in today's presentation. And we publish several reports that give an update to members of the public. That would include the annual tiered licensure and permissions report, the biannual supply and demand report, and several other reports. And one of the things I'm very committed to is increasing the transparency and availability of that data. So we also, thanks to the additional staff we were granted last year, we'll be working on a public facing dashboard that can help provide more data and information on our teacher uh, teaching profession. Um, finally, we do quite a bit of rulemaking and we oversee a few different grant programs which I'll talk about later with nearly $10 million in grant funding distributed each year.
Um, speaking of data, on this slide, we like to give a, a picture of the current teaching profession. So this is just a visual of the demographic breakdown of our 114,000 licensed teachers in the state of Minnesota. Um, as you'll see, we still have the majority of our teachers are um, identify as white, but we are slowly increasing our teachers of color and our American Indian teachers, so we are up to about a little over 6% right now. Um, you'll notice that across all racial and ethnic groups, the percentage of teachers who hold a full professional license, which is defined in rule as a tier three or tier four license, is still higher than the percentage of teachers who hold a tier one or tier two license. So the majority of individuals in our classrooms hold that full professional license. And teachers of color do continue to be overrepresented amongst those tier one and tier two licenses, which identifies the need for more access to professional development, those alt pathways, the licensure we mentioned um, earlier, such as licensure via portfolio. And then finally, again, about 6.16% uh, of our teachers are teachers of color. So we are slowly making an increase there. The last bit of data that I'd like to share with you is just another picture of the profession. And again, all of this comes from our annual supply, our tiered licensure and permissions report, which we publish October of each year. And this just gives you a sense of the proportion of teachers who hold each license. So this gives you the total number of teachers across each racial ethnic group, and then the percentage of those individuals who hold each tiered license. So as you can see again, the majority of teachers across all racial ethnic groups hold those full professional tier three and tier four licenses, but it just gives you a deeper sense of what's going on in our profession. So with that framing of Pelsby's work and of the teaching profession, we'd love to share some updates on implementation of statute that was passed last year. Good morning again, my name is Michelle Hirschbott and I'm Pelsby's chief of staff. Um, a number of changes were made last year that eliminated barriers to licensure. One of the most exciting pieces that came through last year was around licensure exams. So this comes in two pieces. Um, so again, we have a tiered licensure system, one, two, three, and four. And for our professional licensed teachers, three and four, there were exam requirements in place um, that we saw a number of teachers struggle to get through. Um, so the first piece that we'd like to highlight is the elimination of the basic skills examination and that applied to tier four licenses. Um, and the second piece was there was a broad exemption put in place for that content and pedagogy exams, which applied to tier three licenses. And that covered teachers who had completed teacher preparation programs in Minnesota, those who had completed licensure via portfolio and were recommended, as well as teachers who completed teacher prep out of state and completed their state's exams. Um, the impact is between 850 and 1,000 teachers, and we continue to see these teachers every single day applying for that higher tiered license um, including tiers. Um, this is a big change for people's lives. They now hold a professional license. They do not need that school district to apply with them. So this was a very exciting change to put into place um, amongst our board staff. Another change that went into place was the expansion of the bachelor's degree requirement. Um, so as a reminder, there was one existing exemption in place for career and technical education. Um, teachers and career pathways teachers. That was expanded to include two additional groups of teachers, native speakers of a world language, and then visual and performing artists with at least five years of professional experience. Um, so far, we've had 32 tier one licenses issued in this area between um, July 1 and January 30th of this year. Um, and we are excited to continue seeing where this data brings us and where we see new educators enter um, through this new pathway into the teaching profession. Again, we'll continue to see these new pathways coming through. So on a, a new um, pathway that was created was the Heritage Language and Cultures Pathway. This is a licensure via portfolio based pathway um, specifically for heritage language educators. Um, last year's bill included funding for a specialist as well as to support 50 teachers obtain either an initial license or an additional license again in their um, language. Um, so far we're excited to share that we've hired our specialist. Um, we've opened this application process and we received over 90 applications um, and we've selected our first 50 teachers to go through this cohort and we have um, them representing languages from um, a number of different 
native speaking or heritage language communities, including Somali, Hmong, Karen, Arabic, and Spanish. Um, and we're excited to track these teachers and see how this process goes. Um, lots of exciting work happening in this space. Um, another funding piece that came through last year was money to help support a platform for a licensure via portfolio. Um, this does not have um, the most recent data, um, but we are excited to share that funding went to an uh, online platform called ProServa. Um, we've internally hired our specialists to support folks going through the licensure via portfolio process. And so far, we have over 490 teachers who have initiated the licensure via portfolio process through ProServa, um, which is extremely exciting. As a reminder, um, as a criticism that used to come to us is folks used to bring those big binders and say, this is what the portfolio process looks like. We're now excited to share that we are in the 21st century. Folks are able to upload documents in real time to their profile. They're able to receive feedback through ProServa and um, it's really clarified a lot of the process um, that wasn't standards based, right? People don't need to navigate that piece. Now they can focus on how they want to demonstrate how they meet teaching standards so they're able to move forward and get that license. So we're extremely grateful for that funding and excited to see where ProServa takes us and our educators um, as they continue working on their portfolios. And the last item I'll um, address before handing it back over to Dr. Bailey is around our substitute teaching pilot. Um, so there are a number of ways to um, be eligible for a substitute teaching or a short call sub license. Um, but a change made last year was for our pilot program to expand eligibility requirements for um, existing ESPs or paraprofessionals in a district who have been serving for at least one year or for individuals who hold an associate's degree. Um, under this pilot, we've already issued over 250 licenses. Those are short-term licenses. They only last the two years of the pilot. Um, but with that, we're able to see that the vast majority of individuals obtaining that short call sub license through this pilot are paraprofessionals who already have that relationship with the district. Um, but we did see a number of um, individuals come through with an associate's degree. Um, and we will continue collecting data around this piece, but we are excited to share that over 250 individuals are now serving as short call subs under the pilot. All right. Um, so continuing the great work that was done last year, um, one of the things relating to elevating the profession was a new renewal requirement for teachers around American Indian history and culture. And so um, Pelsby was delegated the authority to do rulemaking around that, and we have begun that process. Um, we have received feedback from the Tribal Nations Education Council or committee, uh, as well as from the MDE Tribal Liaison Office of Indian Education, that it's important that we begin this work with uh, tribal consultations. So to date, we've been able to meet with 10 of the 11 tribal nations situated in the land um, that's known as Minnesota. And we were able to get feedback from them on what should be included in the initial draft. And so we plan to bring that to the board this spring and begin the formal rulemaking process. Um, but we've had some very productive conversations on how to even begin this work. Um, so we're very excited about that. We've also been partnering with um, the Minnesota Department of Education with some free resources they have for teachers right now that they can take to fulfill that renewal requirement as it exists. Um, the next thing that we'd love to highlight is the increased funding for the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educators of Color Grant. Um, I was just at a Senate hearing discussing additional uh, funding for this. And it is amazing that with that increase, um, we have been able to see a dramatic um, change in the number of teacher candidates served. So from fiscal year 23 to 24, we went from 291 candidates to 830 teacher candidates of color and indigenous candidates receiving support through this funding. Um, and again, we hear the stories from those candidates when they come and speak or when we visit those institutions. These are lives and that you are impacting and changing by giving them access to the teaching profession. So it's very exciting work. Um, we continue to have teacher preparation providers seek above what we currently have to give, which to me is a sign that there are teachers, uh, people of color who are desiring to enter this profession. And so if the funding is there, um, we can bring more people in. So we're very excited about that. 
The other um, change in funding was related to the Preparation Pathways Grant, which was tied to that new uh, staff position, the Alt Pathways position. And so this grant was one that you passed last year specifically to help teachers who hold a Tier 2 license who are interested in obtaining their full professional license through Portfolio, Alt Pathway, Alt Alternative Teacher Preparation, um, or regular teacher preparation. Um, so, so to this date, we've had 79 teachers apply and be supported through this funding. It is um, $400,000 each year. So we had about 1.6 million that was requested, definitely a need. Um, and you'll see in our bill later that we are um, requesting a slight change to add tier one teachers to be eligible as well so that any individual who's entering through those tier one and tier two who wants to seek that professional license can get funding and support to use those alternative pathways. The final um, piece of grant funding that we'll talk about before I talk about the teacher marketing and outreach campaign <laughs> is the teacher mentorship and retention grant. And so um, that has seen a dramatic increase over the last couple of years. Um, from last year to this fiscal year, we saw a 117% increase in funding. And we had um, this year about just under 6,000 teachers who were served. And of those, about 1,600 are teachers of color or American Indian teachers. About 38 institutions, so that school districts, coalitions, um, education service cooperatives are using this funding to support mentorship across the state of Minnesota. And it's pretty well represented amongst different uh, geographic regions in the state. 69% of this funding went directly to serving our teachers of color and American Indian teachers. So again, the need um, is there and the impact is, is incredible. The final thing we'd like to share in terms of implementation is the teacher marketing and um, outreach grant, which was renewed for another two years. And so if you recall, the first two years with that funding, we were able to create the Elevate Teaching campaign through our vendor partners and um, gathered a lot of data and research through focus groups on what are the, um, not just structural barriers, but often the ideological and cultural barriers to people entering the profession. Why is it that we often hear from teachers? Sometimes, unfortunately, that they wouldn't want their kids to enter the profession. We know that that is a problem. And so Elevate Teaching did focus groups and work to dig into why that is, to work on transforming the narrative, and created this amazing toolkit that's been shared out and used to launch. We recently finished, I should say a couple months ago, finalizing the contract with um, two vendors, Plum Blossom and Collectivity, to continue that work. And so that second phase will, again, continue that work of transforming the narrative through social media campaigns as well as traditional marketing avenues and think of other ways that we can continue to recruit and elevate the status of the profession in our culture. So with that, we'd be happy to answer questions on any of the implementation efforts we shared with you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bailey. <coughs> Sorry, and thank you, um, Dr. Bott, too. So, members, let's see, are there any questions or comments on the work that Pelsby's been doing? Uh, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question concerning um, in this, um, you mentioned that there are a number of teacher exams that have been removed or exempted. Mm -hmm. I've, a uh, question now, Madam Chair, and then a follow-up, but can you remind me which ones we have now, or uh, up to this point, removed or exempted? Um, Dr. Bailey. Yeah, uh, Chair Yuakim, um, Representative Bennett, great question. So for individuals in three groups, we've removed the content and pedagogy exams. So those are individuals who have completed standards-based um, pathways. So that is licensure via portfolio, teacher preparation in the state of Minnesota, or teacher preparation in another state where they've met whatever requirements that state has. Um, we also removed the basic skills exam for all individuals in the state of Minnesota so that you do not need that to get a tier four license anymore. Representative Bennett, follow up. Thanks, Madam Chair, yes. Uh, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. If teachers or prospective teachers, let's say, are having a difficult time passing a particular exam, you know, basic skills, the, the reading, uh, teaching of reading proficiency and that type of thing, why wouldn't we address why they're struggling with that in our teacher ed programs instead of just removing the assessment? Because I don't think we would do that with children. For example, if a child can't read at third grade level and they can't pass that test, we're not gonna say, well, we'll just get rid of the test and then you won't have a problem. Do you know what I'm trying to get at? So mm -hmm. why aren't we addressing this in our teacher ed programs 
instead of removing the assessments and, and thus removing our um, high expectations. Dr. Bailey. Yeah, Chair Yu, Kim Representative Bennett, that's an excellent question and I think an opportunity to help clarify perhaps a common misconception with that policy is that um, Pelsby absolutely believes in high quality measures and standards, which is why we mentioned these are only for standards-based pathways. And so the work that we do that you've delegated to us as an agency is to do that exact work. We audit, we do reviews, we assess and accredit the teacher preparation institutes to ensure that those things are being done. But there's a host of national research that shows that there is no correlation between someone's ability and understanding and mastery of knowledge and skills and their ability to pass a test, that often these tests are just about one's testing ability and that that shows up in a disparate way across race and ethnicity. So for us, what we are trying to do is what many of you championed is remove a structural barrier without compromising on the standards because we're focusing on those when we do the assessment of teacher preparation programs. Representative Bennett, follow up. Thanks, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for that. I, I still have great concerns um, about removing the assessment. I understand some people have a difficult time taking tests, but at the same time, we need to be assured that all of our instructors say can teach the really important skills of how to teach reading and and have basic um, basic skills down. I, I remember I had a number of student teachers throughout my career, and I loved working with them. One of them had a lot of issues with um, grammar and, and language issues like that and in the English language. And that was a concern <coughs> of mine that I noted with her. She needed to go back and get those skills down because it's important as we pass them on to students. So I'll just make that comment. Thanks, Madam Chair. With that, are there any other? Oh, Representative Cruz, do you want to go at the end if there's more? I or? can go to the end. OK. Um, any other questions or comments? because I quick have one. Um, Dr. Bailey, can you remind me if the tier one or two teachers that are in our classrooms have to take those skills test or had to before? Um, yes, Chair Yuki, uh, great question. So they do not have to pass the basic skill test nor the content nor the pedagogy exams. For uh, some individuals, they have to attempt it to move up in the tier two, but they do not have to pass it. So there is no evidence even by the test that they are meeting any sort of standards or content knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Um, with that, members, I don't see any other questions, so I'll go to Representative Krisha. Thank you, and thank you for uh, thank you for being here. So this is actually, I'm, I'm trying to get a clarifying, and I'm gonna just ask you to have a conversation. Not, I have no preconceived notion this was presented to me the last couple of weeks. So i um, been working with some schools around the state on uh, the commercial driver's license. And there's uh, where some schools are getting excited about this. They're setting up classes, and I keep, when I keep asking what you know what's not working, Pelsby's name has been thrown out a couple of times. So I'm like, well, let me just ask Pelsby. So if and I think I know the process, but I want to make sure that I I hear it from you so that I can go back with the correct information. So if a school is working with a let's say they have a class that will do a commercial driver's license class, um, that and if there's a teacher, maybe it's somebody inside the school or maybe somebody outside the school that would teach that class is. What's the process or is there any concerns about how we get a qualified teacher in front of those students from Pelsby's point of view? And again, I'm not, I'm just, this, this was presented to me and so I just wanna make sure I ask. Dr. Bailey. Yeah, Chair Yu, uh Representative Krisha, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I think that the driver's license part seems like that could be any subject. So I think is the question, what is the process of getting somebody to teach a course outside of their licensure area, or what is the process of bringing someone from the outside in terms of background checks? So I just, I, I think a little bit of clarity would help me with this. Representative Krisha. And, and thank you, and thank you, Dr. Bader. And I think this is, and just because uh, you're absolutely right, and I'm not clear either. There, you know, what I've heard is, hey, you have an individual that works uh, as a commercial truck driver. He's a licensed teacher, he teaches people outside, but now he's coming to the classroom and I've asked the school, why can't you use them? And like, oh, Pelsby, and I'm like, well, what does that mean? So that's why I'm asking you, is there anything that's a barrier to that so I can go back with correct information and say, no, we can, we can make this happen? Dr. Bailey. 
Yeah, sure, you came representative Christian. Thank you for that. That helps. I think that sounds like someone who may be interested in coming in to do a CTE course. Mm -hmm. And we have individuals who can come in, again, through Tier 1 or Tier 2 licenses without having gone through teacher prep to do those kinds of assignments. They would go through the normal process of applying with the district for a license. They would go through the background check, and then they would be issued that. So I'm, I'm wondering if that district maybe has some other questions or the process maybe some questions about the process that we could help answer. So I would encourage, um, you're welcome to send them to me directly and I can help. We actually have our licensing and operations manager here today and our licensing supervisor I can connect them to. Um, and normally in those cases, once we meet and talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, we can help them figure it out and they can apply. I represent Krisha. And thank you for that. And I, actually, I was defending calls because I, I believe that was the process, but I wanted to hear it because when they threw this up, I'm like, no, I think there's actually a way to do this, and Pelsby is not your barrier. So thank you. I will take that information. Thank, thank you, Representative Krisha. With that, um, we are going to move on to our next. And thank you so much, both of you, for being here today and going over the amazing work that you're doing and moving folks along through the process and getting more teachers in our classroom. Um, with that, we have Representative Hill up for a bill here. Representative Hill, you have House File 4361. Thank you, Chair. You came. Thank you, Representative Hill. As you get settled, would you like to move House File 4361 before the committee today for with the intention of laying, laying over for possible inclusion in the education finance bill. Yes, that would be the motion, Chair. Thank you, Representative Hill. With that, members, we have House File 4361 in front of us, and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Members, uh, this bill includes Pelsby's legislative platform, uh, statutory changes uh, related to last year's work. And as we move forward, it's going to do, among other things, support our newest teachers, uh, provide them with high-quality PD, provide them with mentoring, it's going to remove some required licensure exams, which we've heard about previously, and it's going to adjust some of the timelines for reporting deadlines. Uh, with that, I will turn it over uh, to testimony from Dr. Bailey, uh, also uh, Ms. Bout, and I know there's another uh, testifier as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bailey, please state your name again for the record and proceed. <laughs> Yes, my name is Dr. Elena Bailey, and I'm the Executive Director of Pelsby, and I have here with me Michelle Hirschvat, my Chief of Staff, who will actually get us started on the first few sections of the bill. Please state your name for the record again and proceed. Good, after, good morning again. I'm Michelle Hirschvat. I'm Pelsby's Chief of Staff. Um, so I will walk through the first three sections of the bill before you. Um, the first section is specific to a new report that came out of um, the Increased Teachers of Color Act last year um, around a report that requires Pelsby, the Office of Higher Education, and the Minnesota Department of Education to collaborate to prepare a report that documents a number of different um, grant programs that seek to increase um, the teacher diversity across the state. This section would modify the final report date um, to push it out to 2025, um, which would allow us time to actually distribute those funds um, and collect um, outcomes from those grant programs. Section two um, is another modification to an ex existing report um, around our supply and demand report. This would align our reporting timeline to November 2025, which would align perfectly with that ITCA report, um, as well as clarifies the pieces that are included in this report. Section three, um, that begins on page three, clarifies um, the board of school administrators' responsibilities over <coughs> operational duties, as well as clarifies data collection responsibilities held by the board regarding some data that is shared with the Minnesota Department of Education. Sections four through six um, simply codify the federal requirements for teachers holding a tier one or tier two license in a special education field. Um, this again is in response to some feedback uh, or some information we received from the federal office of special education programs related to Minnesota and non-compliance. And so this simply codifies those federal requirements to ensure that everyone is meeting them. It does not add any additional burdens to districts and in fact, should help prevent um, any worries about potential lawsuits for those districts. And it does not modify eligibility to licensure in any way. 
Jumping to section seven, which begins at line 5.17, um, is a terminology change, and it clarifies that a teacher is recommended for licensure via the portfolio process. They're not necessarily granted a license. That takes place after someone has applied for a license, completed their background check, et cetera. Section eight expands pathways to a tier four license to include uh, teachers who were initially licensed through the portfolio process. As we've mentioned, licensure via, via portfolio is an important alternative pathway, and we want to make sure that it is elevated and seen as the equivalent of other pathways to a full professional license. Additionally, this would add national board certification, which is an extremely rigorous process, as another pathway to a tier four license. Section nine also expands the exemption from content and pedagogy exams to include teachers who hold national board certification. Again, because it is a rigorous standards-based pathway. Section 10 modifies section 122A.15, which governs testing in Minnesota. Um, and this clarification removes the reference to basic skills examinations as that's no longer a testing requirement for any of the license seeking a tiered license. Section 11, which begins at 7.23, codifies the common practice of removing a teacher from a teaching assignment after being charged with a crime identified in our auto revocation statute. Um, and for our policy wonks, that's in 122A.20 subdivision 1B, which lists all of those criminal um, convictions that would fall into the auto revocation. Sections 12 and 13 clarify that district teacher development and evaluation programs must be aligned to the standards of effective practice. We have consulted with our colleagues at MDE and that was always the intention of that language. It says standards of uh, the teaching profession, um, but this would, it's simply a technical change to make it clear to districts what the expectation is. It does not modify how they do their td and &E programs and it doesn't impact local control. It simply clarifies so that people know that should reference the standards of effective practice. All right, our tour of chapter 122A is almost concluding. Um, at section 14, um, which is on page 13, both section 14 and 15 clarify 122A.631, which is the new statute governing the Heritage Language and Culture Pathway Licensure Program. Um, so section 14 clarifies the definition. And then section 15 allows Pelsby to prioritize program participation using top languages spoken by Minnesota students. And that um, comes from a Minnesota Department of Education report that's released, as well as licensure scarcity. So we can look at where licensure programs are across the state um, and the ability for a participant to use those pathways. Um, section 16 expands eligibility for the teacher mentorship grant to include tribal contract schools. There are four located within Minnesota, so that would ensure they're able to apply um, next year. Section 17 expands eligibility to that preparation pathways grant. Um, that grant is currently um, limited to individuals with a tier two license. This would expand the eligibility to include teachers who hold that tier one license. And finally, section 18 has repealer language. Again, more cleanup. It repeals a redundant reporting requirement. Um, as well as references to teaching or to testing requirements. That was a lot. We're happy to answer questions, but we also want to respect your time here today. Members, do folks have any questions about uh, this technical bill? You see there is some money in section, I think, 17 on the tier one to two teachers because we're expanding the eligibility, so we want to make sure we give them the funds to help folks do that. Um, Oh, Rep. Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have um, a, a very basic question about licensure and um, not specific necessarily to special education teachers, but um, you know, I hear a lot about income barriers to getting licensed. Um, you know, you might have a four-year degree, but you might need to spend another two years full-time getting licensure. Um, and it costs a lot of money. It might cost like $30,000 and then you do the student teaching and the student teaching isn't paid for. Um, I'm, I'm curious what kind of, um, you know, what kind of plan do we have to eliminate that barrier? Because a lot of people can't afford to become licensed, I think is what we're running into. Not only is there 
the expense of a four-year degree, but there's also the expense that you um, pay for getting a license. So I'm curious um, if there are any thoughts on how we can help that. Um, Dr. Bailey, uh, <laughs> that's a broad question, um, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and then Representative Hill after that. Yep. Uh, Chair Yuki, members of the committee, I can speak to, there are several proposals, not from Pelsby, um, but that our board has voted to formally support related to kind of paid student teaching. Um, we testified this morning in support of additional scholarships for teacher candidates of color. So there are definitely structural barriers in terms of cost uh, related to teacher preparation, but there are many proposals to address those. I think additionally, this is one of the reasons why we are so focused on uh, making sure the public understands and is aware of alternative pathways like alternative teacher preparation programs and portfolio, particularly for individuals who maybe completed a BA already and are career changers and want to become teachers but do not want to go back to do additional schooling. The licensure via portfolio is designed for them so they get content credit for whatever their degree is in and they do need to meet those pedagogical standards but we have staff now who can help walk them through what that looks like how to you know, get a mentor, work in a district on a tier one or tier two license, develop those skills, and then get their licensure via portfolio. So there are a number of pathways, but I think um, in addition to us formally supporting you know, paid student teaching and other proposals like that, I think part of it is elevating um, you know, some of these alternative pathways so the members of the public are aware that they are there. And Representative Hill, you wanted to? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Members, uh, there are some exciting proposals coming forward. I know Representative Morris, or excuse me, Norris is uh, bringing forth a bill that looks at uh, pay for our student teachers, uh, and as well as all of the elements that uh, Ms. Vaught and, and Dr. Bailey have talked about as far as expanding those pathways. Thank you. Um, Representative Green, did you have a follow up at all? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, just wanted to highlight that, that sometimes it's just too expensive to get licensed, and that's unfortunate because there are a lot of great um, aspiring teachers out there who might have a four-year degree. They might have a lot of business background and all that, and um, they're great in a classroom, but they might not be able to get that licensure. So whatever we can do to improve um, opportunities for people to be able to teach in a classroom and maybe give them more time to get licensed and you know, eliminate those financial barriers, I think that would be a real big step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Raymond. And um, thank you, Dr. Bailey and Ms. Vaught and Representative Hill for highlighting all the different pathways that we do have to make sure that we have professionals in our classrooms. Um, any other further questions? Seeing none, Representative Hill, final comments. No, just a message, uh, thank you, Chair Yukim. Just a message of thanks to our colleagues at Pelsby uh, for their ongoing work um, that uh, will continue to expand and, and move forward as we address the challenges in front of us each year. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Representative Hill. And I had forgotten to say we did have somebody signed up to testify, but they sent us an email saying that they couldn't make it and they'll provide um, some written comments. So I forgot to say that. Uh, with that, uh, we'll. I renew the motion for House File 4361 to be laid over for possible inclusion in an education finance bill. And with that, we have a MDE overview for the a bill that's coming up next so folks understand how our financing works for intermediate and cooperative school districts. So with that, we have a special treat, actually. We have... Um, Paul Farron here from the Special Education Funding and Data Supervisor for the Minnesota Department of Education. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, my name is Paul Farron. I am the Special Education Funding and Data Supervisor <laughs> at the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, here to kind of give a quick overview on the Special Education Funding Formula uh, with specifics as to how it is applied to uh, intermediate LEAs and service cooperatives, uh, joint powers. Uh, usually I just always refer to them as uh, cooperatives uh, as it covers education <laughs> districts, regional centers, uh, the intermediates, uh, and uh, consortiums, all the various types. Uh, there's a number of them uh, listed types in the state of Minnesota for opportunities for schools to form joint powers. Uh, so usually we just refer to them as then uh, all cooperatives when they're formula wise is the same for all entities. Uh, the current special education funding formula contains two separate formulas. 
uh, which are applicable to all LEA types. Uh, the initial aid formula along with then the excess cost. Uh, these calculations are the same for all LEA types, since, as I said. Um, additionally, there is also the cross-subsidy and homeless aid, which is applicable only to school districts, and then the charter tuition aid, which is obviously only <coughs> applicable to charter schools. Uh, but the main focus and the initial starting point of any time we calculate state special education aid uh, is doing the initial aid calculation first, followed by the excess cost aid. Uh, initial aid is a three individual formula calculation uh, applied to all and on an individual basis that looks at uh, both their expenditures, uh, expenditures that were eligible under the 2015 and prior funding formula laws, along with their total expenditures, um, which are you know non being used, non charged to federal funds. Uh, additionally, there's a third formula that looks at uh, census basis for populations served within each individual LEA. And ultimately, between the three separate calculations, uh, an LEA's initial aid will equal the lesser of the three numbers. Uh, once we have the initial aid calculation, we're able to move on to the excess cost calculation. Uh, and here, we're pulling in the difference of their unreimbursed costs, so total program costs uh, minus the amount of aid that they received in the initial aid calculation. Uh, and then there basically diverges to two separate calculations depending on how much general education revenue is used. In the case of intermediates, the only general education revenue that's being used is the compensatory revenue that is paid directly to them, uh, whereas for school districts and charter schools, it's their total general education revenue, so the uh, minus some local option revenue, but it's really the bulk of their general ed revenue. Uh, it does use a small percentage, uh, either two and a half or seven percent, depending on which version of the formula ultimately is the winner. Uh, with the excess cost fun funding formula, you are paid the greater of the two options uh, ultimately. Uh, besides the deduction first of your total your prior year costs minus your aid uh, from initial aid, and then deducting either of this two and a half percent or seven percent of general education revenue. Uh, the last is this general education to defray component. Uh, with this component, uh, we're looking at the amount of general education revenue that was received on a student student level uh, for students who spend more than 60% of their time outside of the regular education classroom, uh, generally in a special education resource room or in a separate site itself. Uh, the general education revenue is just the instructional percentage that would be, you know, normally used for that student uh, or general education teachers, classroom supplies, uh, related materials, uh, and likewise. Um, in total, in the most recent closed year, fiscal year 23, this was $118.7 million statewide. Um, <clears throat> on the co-op intermediate side of it alone, they accounted for about $11.8 million of it. Uh, so this additionally is deducted uh, from their unreimbursed cost and nets out to then how much each LEA would receive in excess cost aid. Uh, once initial and excess cost aid is complete, uh, then we're able to move on to tuition billing, uh, whereby we take you know current year costs minus the initial and excess cost aid uh, to start creating rates to apply to non-resident students. Uh, so that's kind of the quick summary for how the main special education funding formula works uh, with the initial and excess cost uh, being funded the same for all LEA types, um, kind of going forward as it is right now. Thank you, Mr. Farron. Um, next time I'm going to have to sit down with you for about an hour so I can create a chart so I can see the flow chart as we talk about it. But no, thank you for highlighting all the different ways they do the offset and that it's a very complicated um, formula. Members, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Farron? <laughs> Seeing none, I, I, I will buy you coffee and have you help me walk through it with a flow chart. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, members, yes. next up we have House File 4333, and that's uh, my bill, so I will turn the gavel over to uh, <coughs> Vice Chair Clardy.
So our next agenda, agenda item is House File 4333. Chair Yuakim, would you like to move House File 4333 before the committee with the intention to lay over the bill for possible inclusion in the Ed Finance Bill? Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Yes, I will. That is my motion. You may present your bill. Thank you. Just gonna a little organized here. <clears throat> All right, folks. So we got a little taste of that with Mr. Farron here, but there is also a fiscal note in your packet that I would like um, Mr. Strom to go over a fiscal. Mr. Strom. Uh, Madam Chair, members, there's two documents in your packet that may be helpful to look at as they're going through the uh, bill that's in front of you. The first of those is the fiscal note. Uh, that's a, a two-sheet, four-page document, and uh, it explains the way that the particular character calculations are going to work for the cooperative school districts. And if you look at the front page of that document, uh, you'll see that the, that the net impact is listed there at $10.4 million. So passage of House File 4333 would, would impact your budget uh, by increasing it by $10.4 million in uh, fiscal 25 and then lesser amounts of $8.8 .8 .8 million in fiscal 26 and $8.4 million in fiscal 27. If you look at the bottom of the second page of that fiscal note, Here's where the calculations are uh, uh, that essentially explain what Mr. Farron was talking about. For the excess cost aid, by removing this exemption, if you're looking at the chart at the bottom of that page, uh, the uh, entitlement impact would be $11.89 million. That means that removing the uh, general education offset fr from what Mr. Farron referred to as the defray, uh, increases the overall amount of special education by $11.9 million. Then if you look to the next line, what that increased funding on the front end of the formula does is save a tuition chargeback to the resident school districts. And if you look in the 26 column, you'll see the $3.4 million number. And that's the amount of cross-subsidy savings to the formula uh, meaning that uh, uh, the cross-subsidy goes down by, by twice that since essentially 50% of the cross-subsidy is funded. So, so excess cost data is going up on an entitlement basis by $11.9 million. The amounts the intermediates and other co-ops would bill back to their member districts and their resident districts of the students in their programs is uh, about $7 million, and that savings then would be $3.5 million in the uh, cross-subsidy savings. So that nets out for you. There's some uh, uh, complicated uh, ways that we do the 90-10 split for special education that you can ignore for now. But the main thing is that the intermediate school districts and other cooperatives would receive uh, about $11.9 million more in aid, and school districts would receive about $7 million less. They'd get savings of about $7 million of the amount that's built back. Uh, uh, from the intermediate and other cooperative units. Uh, so, Madam Chair, members, that's the fiscal note real quick. And then I've got a very quick uh, 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 explanation of the lines on the printout. If you'll all turn to page three of the printout, uh, Superintendent Dowd's intermediate is intermediate 287. So if you look three quarters of the way down the, the printout there, you can follow across in the different cost amounts for intermediate 287. And you'll see the regular aid that Mr. Farron mentioned is estimated at $7.4 million. The excess cost aid at $19.8 million under current law. And the amount that they're billing back to their uh, resident districts of each student is currently that $29.3 million. What's gonna happen for intermediate 287 under this bill is that $19.7 million will go up by their share of the 11 million statewide and the 29 billion, uh, million going uh, uh, built back to the resident districts for each of their students will go down by that 7 million or so statewide. So just so members can follow along, you can see the other school districts and uh, 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 charter schools and intermediates on this printout as well and see the amount of revenue in each of those columns for them. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Chair Joachim, you can proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Strom, and thank you again to Paul Farron. This is why we have really smart people looking at these numbers for us. So members, last session we talked a lot about the special education cross subsidy. This phrase is used to describe the amount of money a district may need to pull from their general funds to cover the investment that is lacking from the federal government in any sort of shortfall from the state special education funding. With a substantial state investment last year, we were able to cut our school's cross subsidies in half. When discussing the special ed cross subsidy, we primarily usually talk about our traditional public school districts. But our intermediate and cooperative school district special education programs create uh, cross subsidy issues due to their unique state funding stream. As a reminder, intermediates and other cooperative school districts serve students in a collaboration with the individual school districts in their areas. These member districts send students to an intermediate or cooperative partner because the individual school district may not have the capacity to serve that student, certain, certain student population. So for me, that is Intermediate District 287 um, for about 12 of us districts in the West Metro. Uh, intermediate and cooperative schools are funded a bit differently than an individual school district. While e intermediate and cooperatives receive some direct special education funding, they do not receive the average daily membership funding that an individual school district receives. Because of that, the intermediates and cooperatives are allowed to bill back their cost differentials, their cross subsidy to each student's residential school district. Because of the population of students with special needs that these programs serve, and the ability to bill back to their member districts, intermediate and other cooperative schools receive a reduction in state special ed access cost aid. And those are the calculations Mr. Farron walked over as well as Mr. Strom. This is because the formula offsets a portion of the student's special education access aid by cost by a portion of the student's general education aid, lowering the intermediate or cooperative school's direct special education funding from the state. This results in a reduction in the amount of special ed available to provide programming for students with the most significant <coughs> special education needs. House File 4333 proposes to eliminate the <coughs> general education offset um, from the excess calculation cost for intermediates and other cooperative schools. This will result in an additional excess cost aid for these schools and lower special education tuition bills for the traditional school districts that are their members. Basically, it will allow the intermediate and cooperatives to send a smaller bill to their individual districts because we'll be backfilling a portion of that with more state aid. Luckily, I have our experts in this area in the room to answer any more detailed questions if I haven't confused you enough already. Um, we have nonpartisan fiscal staff here as well as Superintendent Marcy Dowd from Intermediate School District 287, who I'd like to turn this over to next. Thanks, Chair Yulikim. Uh, will you please identify yourself for the record? Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Marcy Dowd, and I'm the superintendent for Intermediate School District 287. Um, I'm, that's in the West Metro. Um, first, I want to start with the special ed funding formula is quite complex, right? We're just going to talk about a small portion of it and its impact. And it starts with our fundamental belief around our students that we serve. We say all students are students in general education. And some students receive intervention services above their general education services. Some students receive English language, and some students receive special education. But all students are students in general education and have the right to all of what general education programming provides. If you fundamentally agree with this, you should know that the current language in the aid, excess cost aid formula does not. The current language requires students who receive special education for 50% or more of their day to have a portion of their general education aid defray the cost of special education before we get special education aid. There is no other group of students, not students that receive lesser services, that receive intervention, or receive English language services that has a portion of their general ed aid defray their cost of their specialized services. That's concerning. I would say that the bill is not only old language, or, or our statute is not only old language, I would say it's discriminatory to a certain group of students who need more special education than others. And so the, what does this mean for programming? 
when you don't have enough general education aid or you have aid, general education aid being used to defray your special education, you don't have enough general education aid to provide the continuum of general ed services that all students get. That's not okay. And so when you think about it, we need our students that have the most significant needs, they need access to general education teachers, general education programming, music, art, about $2.5 million of the general ed aid that District 287 gets is used to offset our special ed expenditures. So I need to build back my member districts more because of this. And again, it's only a certain group of students that this is impacting. And so I ask you to um, support the bill language um, and support our students to get all what all students have the right to get, and that's general education services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dowd. Um, we have no members from the public that are here to testify on House File 433. Um, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Members? Chair Pryor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I won't ask all my <laughs> questions, because <laughs> uh, that would take too long and probably it wouldn't serve any purpose knowing that this is moving forward and the proper people understand it well enough. Um, but I do have uh, questions kind of on the impact of things. Um, if we were able to um, increase this funding the way that it's described in the, in the bill. And part of it, I do understand that this is an increase in funding. Um, uh, that we would that we would be doing and that it's ongoing funding um, and so I think and also I just want to say at the beginning is that I think this is definitely worthwhile bringing forward and it should be something that we're definitely looking at um, if nothing else because of the confusion of how this is swirling around um, and what we need is this transparency and how we spend how we fund all of our students and this is a com com particularly complicated way of doing it mm -hmm. so well, the specific question that I have that I thought might be worth bringing forward is I know some school districts, um, you know, they use the model of, of having the intermediate districts um, to refer their students that need um, higher levels of, of um, um, intervention or special education. Um, and I visited those schools and they're wonderful and I, and I just love being there. Um, glad that I've had that opportunity. So, so some so school districts do refer students. Other school districts um, have their own, it seems like, comparable system. Do you think that if we funded this differently, would that make a difference to cho the kind of the choices that an individual school district might make um, based on this altered funding? Go ahead, um, Ms. Dowd. I'm sorry, Ms. Yeah, Marcy Dowd. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it would, it, um, but really when you think about student districts that have their own, what we call special education federal setting four, don't typically, are not typically members of intermediate districts because um, they don't have the economy of scale to provide that unique uh, programming. And so, in regards to choice, um, we enroll students in our intermediate or re take referrals only from our member districts, and that's pretty consistent across the intermediates. Um, the language is impactful to any student that's in a Fed Four, um, and so but we brought this forward specifically because of the significant impact in intermediates, cooperatives, and regionals. Thank you, Chair Yuki. Thank you, Representative, uh, uh, Chair Clarity. What I would like to add to that too is many districts do, if they have their own level four, I know Hopkins has a small one, um, but they still are member districts and send students to 287. Um, our member districts that are districts that might have their own level four um, may have students that are their, they're their home district, but they have open enrolled somewhere else. And that home district is still responsible if wherever that student goes, um, to school, if they're sending their di their students to an intermediate, that home district gets the bill back too. So it still helps folks that have a level four internal program because they're still responsible for all their students within their geographic boundaries, even if they open enroll and they get sent to an intermediate 
or have those other billbacks. So this is just a start to looking at that billback system that's been complicated and never really meant for special ed. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing discussion after that. Thanks for the clarification. Um, Chair Pryor, any follow-up? Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll speak with this microphone so I can see both of you. Um, <laughs> First, I just want to say thanks for the extra instruction on education funding in general. If there's one thing I've learned about education funding, it is always a mind-spinning experience. It's like being on a roller coaster with all those twists and turns and, and twirls. So thank you for that. And I just want to add that I, I'd seen, I think this bill seems like a good idea. Um, I've spoken with a lot of the homeschool districts and then, of course, the receiving uh, cooperatives and intermediates, and they all say that this bill back issue is very complicated, concerning lots of issues with it. So I think anything we can do to streamline it or reform it is a great thing. And so thanks for bringing this forward. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Chair Yoakim, your final words on the bill? Thank you, uh, Chair Clarity, and thank you, Representative Bennett, for. Um, reaching out to your home districts to find out about this because it does affect everyone across the state and like I said the bill back issue is something um, we need to really dig into and this is just like that first step that can really help. So thank you for your time and attention to a really complex area and if I do get that flow chart I will make sure that you all get it too. Um, as you heard in testimony like I said this is a small fix that can make a big difference to bills that your districts are seeing from their intermediate and cooperative partners across the state and also for the bills they're seeing when a um, member from their home district open enrolls. So I would love your support for this bill. Thank you, Chair Yukim. And with that, uh, the chair lays over House File 4333 for a possible inclusion in the Education Finance Bill. And I'll hand the gavel back to Chair Yukim. Thank you, members. I didn't have much more to say. I should have just had Chair Clarity gavel us out. Um, but no, thank you for the conversation. I'm going to have to start bringing coffee this morning when we go over these complex issues. But with that, members, we're back again tomorrow and Thursday, same time, same place. With that, we're adjourned.